Okay, good morning everyone. Uh, great to see such a fantastic turnout. My name is David Walker. I'm the Head of Technology Enhanced Learning at the University of Sussex. I'm delighted to be joined today by my colleague from Pearson Education, uh, Esther Job. Esther is the Head of Academic Services at Pearson. Uh, we have what we hope you will find uh, quite an interesting but also an interactive session planned for you today. Our plan is to introduce you to design thinking and to expose you to the thinking that has underpinned the ethos of the new online provision we've been developing at Sussex. Provision that we hope captures the distinctive academic endeavour of Sussex, some of the more uh, free-spirited traditions of the university as well, and also quite some of the, the radical nature of our student body too. What we hope through this session is not just to introduce you to design thinking, but to get you to think about how this might be applied within your own professional practice as well. So we'll be inviting you to think about the vision that you might have for your courses, the principles that might underpin the design of courses that you develop, modules as well, and also um, some of the values that are behind some of this. So it's going to be quite an interactive session, so I hope you will enjoy and participate. So a little bit of background about our partnership. It's a very exciting partnership for us at Sussex. It's a new partnership. We just signed uh, an agreement with uh, Pearson uh, just 12 months ago. Uh, we are working together uh, to develop... Oh, it's moving forward. We're working together uh, to develop these new online uh, courses. So we will take you through this and we will explain uh, the background to the partnership and also the process that we've gone to try and give these courses a distinctive identity. So at Sussex, you know, one of the things that we are known for is new ways of making change. Uh, created within the 1960s with the, the conception of uh, redrawing the map of learning, very much famed for our inter interdisciplinary teaching. Uh, so we wanted to take this ethos into our online courses as well. As a university, we are quite late to this space and we recognize this. Many of the, the leading universities in the country have had distance learning provision for many years. We recognized we needed to have a partner with expertise in this space who would enable us to move in here and meaningfully allow us to provide high quality experience to learners who would want to come and study with Sussex. So why are we doing this? Why is it a partnership between uh, Pearson and Sussex? Well, we have a shared goal. We wish to offer the highest quality learning experience to students who otherwise would not have been able to benefit from a Sussex education. That was very important to us. So people who would want to come to Sussex but who can't, whether that's for financial reasons, caring responsibilities, or they can't get a visa. Uh, we want to extend the university's presence globally, and this will be the same for many of your institutions. So we recognize that we have a, a reputation within the UK, but we also want to have a presence abroad, not necessarily by having a physical location in another country, but certainly by engaging in the online space. We are quite constrained as a university. Uh, the actual campus itself is located in the South Downs National Park. It is a stunning location. When students come to our away days and open days, they are immediately uh, fall in love with it. However, that's not something that's open to everyone who lives across the globe. So we are very much restricted on how many people we can have on campus. So the only way we can grow as an institution is to move into online space. But what is really important to me as the head of technology enhanced learning is I want to look at how we can take innovative practice from the digital space and bring it back to our on campus teaching. So the techniques of facilitating learning online, how you structure content, how you chunk knowledge uh, is very important and will be beneficial to what we're doing. But underpinning this all uh, has been a focus on design thinking and how we bring this into what we hope will be a very distinctive offer. We don't want something that is just a cookie cutter approach that many other universities have taken. Uh, so we have worked with Pearson uh, to come up with something that we think is quite unique. So Esther. So um, somewhere in amongst that sea of people that we weren't expecting quite so many, welcome, thank you. Um, there are some handouts, but I'm assured that if you have the mobile app that the attachment to our session is also a copy of the handout. So if you've got some technology and you don't have the handout, um, then please do download it for yourselves. So we've been using design thinking as an approach to curriculum design for some time now. And we think that it helps us really understand our learners. At Pearson, our focus is always on the learner. Um, our learning design products, for our books is what will the learner do with this and so design thinking for us that tries to empathize with the users of whatever the product is that you're developing um, 
is a really, really helpful approach. And how many of you are familiar with design thinking as an approach for creative development? Have a quick show of hands. Okay, a few. So you may not find this as exciting and interactive and um, engaging as the others, so, but please bear with us. And if you're an expert, help the person who's sat next to you. Um, this is the design thinking process. It's a five-stage process that puts the user, or in our case, the learner, at the centre of that experience. It starts with an, an empathise place. So who are our learners? What will they be doing? How will they be learning? What do we want them to learn? What do we want that experience for that learner to look like? In some respects, we're curriculum agnostic. We, we don't necessarily think about this as students that are here to study chemistry or business or food science or whatever it might be. Um, it's who are these learners, what are their aspirations? <coughs> we then also that use that empathised data, loosely, for those of you that are scientists, um, to construct a point of view based on their needs and insights. How are we going to meet the challenges? We then spend a huge amount of time doing what is called ideating, which I kind of hate as a word, that it's, it doesn't even look like it should be a word. There's far too many vowels in it, for a start. Um, and that's where we start to develop some creative solutions. And we don't like to tie ourselves to what the technology can do that we're working with. We like to think of what are the solutions that solve the needs and the problems and challenges that we've started to consider through the empathise phrase phase. Then we start to prototype. Now we're starting to do more rapid prototyping, which as an organisation is challenging us somewhat, um, because Pearson's very large and rapid prototyping likes to work in small teams, not very big ones. Um, but it helps because we're able to get to a point to demonstrate something and test it with our clients, with our users, and to see whether or not that proof of concept really works. So, we're going to take you on a 60% sprint because we can't do the last two phases because we can't actually get to prototyping unless there's some really, really clever people that can do it in five minutes in the room. No? Okay. So, for those of you that have handouts and those of you that don't, hopefully somebody near you has a handout and you can see what we're doing. What I would like you to first think about, either individually or sat next to each other, Talk to your pair, standard lecturer thing. Talk to your pair, talk to the person behind you. If you're sat on your own, <coughs> nobody's sat on their own. Good. Um, and think about what do you want, if you were putting an online program on, what do you want your learners to say about that program one month after completion, one year after completion, and five years after completion? So have a think about that. If we were in a workshop... I'd be keeping 3N in business with a towering pile of different coloured post-it notes that everybody would have. And I'd be asking you <coughs> to think about what success looks like on the basis of that one month after completion, five years after completion, and one year after completion, excuse me. Now we have, there's a bit of technology. If you are familiar with Padlet... We have a Padlet for you. You can use that bit.ly link to access it. And then we'll be able to see some of your responses. So if you've got some technology open and you can use Padlet, please do. I'm going to give you a few minutes just to think about one month after completion, one year after completion, and five years after completion. So I'm going to give you two minutes. We're super excited about the fact that it actually worked. That's, that's, you know, technology conference. It's the kiss of death to actually try and use technology at the conference. So it actually worked. Oh, now. I can, oh, no. I beg your pardon? Oh, I can see it there. You all have contributed. Well done. What we, David and I have decided that we can't necessarily share this with you, so what we'll do is we'll arrange with Canvas to download the, the PDF of Padlet and we'll add it to our session after the fact. So once you've downloaded the app, you'll be able to download the outcomes from it. Does that sound like a deal? Okay, cool. Thank you for participating. Right. 
Oh, now it won't do anything else. Next. Next. Yay. That's what the output of one of these workshops starts to look like. You can see why I'm kind of keeping 3M in business. That's quite normal. When you do this with a group of academics and you do this with a group of staff in a university, it, it really does bring people together to help them identify what the core things are that are important to them. And so, David and his colleagues went through this process, and these are the core things that were important to them. So just as you did there, we thought about what our vision was going to be for our courses, and we started to think about one month uh, and into the future, one year and five years' time as well. And we came up with a vision, and it's not a particularly radical vision. It's one that you might imagine most institutions would come to. Ours was to become an internationally recognised brand leader in the provision of distinctive, and that was very important to us, high-quality online distance learning master's degrees with a research-led curriculum. So as I said earlier, this was about encapsulating the ethos of Sussex but also the research culture that we have too. So from that piece of work that you've just done in a very short space of time, we came up with a vision. But from that, we also began to distill a set of principles that would underpin these courses to give that distinctive flavour. And these are they. We came up with four, uh, and these were important to us. We wanted our courses to be authentic. We wanted the individuals who join our courses to engage in real-world experiences, to be able to apply their learning to the context that they come from, whether that's uh, in the UK or internationally, wherever they are in the world. We wanted them to be supported, something that's very, very important to me about online learning. I've been working in this space for about 15 years, is that online learning is not abandoned learning. We want them to be supported. We want them to feel connected to others. And that became another key principle too. We want them to be connected to peers. We want them to be connected to the professional communities that they're going to join after they leave the course. Uh, we want them to experience experts in the field and try and bring that externality into the courses as well. But something that's very important, and many of you will agree with this, is it has to be challenging, particularly for a master's level course. It has to be at the right level. We want people who are critical learners confident critical learners to challenge and critique existing norms. Again, something that is very much in line with the ethos of Sussex. <laughs> Once we went through this process of distilling this to a vision and a set of principles, we began to think about the learners themselves and we went into the next stage of the sprint and to start thinking about who are our learners, what do they look like, where do they come from. So, step two is... <coughs> Learner personas. Now, learner personas, if you work in marketing or if you've worked in any one of these creative industries, are fictional characters that embody different aspects of your learners, their goals, their needs, and their expectations. So if you have the handout or you've managed to download it, you'll see that I've given you on the back of the sheet that's got the design thinking piece a little persona to complete. So you've got a little head and shoulders of a person. It's absolute requirement that you give them hair a nose, eyes, and a smile, okay, no grumpy faces. But also, I want you to think about what are their demographics? How old are they? Where do they live? I also want you to consider what their motivations are for this online course that you've just thought about one year, one month, and five years after. Why are they doing that? What's their primary goal at the end of it? What do they enjoy about learning? And that isn't watching football on telly or anything like that. It's, do they enjoy learning with others? Do they enjoy learning on their own? Do they enjoy reaching out to external organisations and learning in practice? How do they prefer to learn? Are they like me, that I really need to read something and then write notes on it because I'm old school? Or have they got a different type of preference of how they learn? And then, what challenges or obstacles might they face that will make online learning difficult? So I'm going to give you two or three minutes amongst yourselves to think about somebody who might come on your online program and to start fleshing out some of those demographics and to start understanding and empathising with them and their needs. So, you've got two minutes to get a pen portrait of somebody. Go. OK, um, Francis has given me the seven minute warning, seven minutes to coffee. So um, we, have to get a, we have to get a wiggle on. 
Now, your, your demographics are giving you the person and their needs and expectations. The next thing, which I'm not going to ask you to do, but I would do if we were doing this for real, is the how can we. This is a bit of the ideation phase in reality. How do we solve the problems that those challenges, needs and expectations give us? Now, many of you are learning technology professionals and you'll automatically jump to the technology and congratulations, well done. But there's also other softer things around that learner experience, as David indicated, about student support and the structure of the curriculum and how it guides students through. So not all of the solutions that we come up with in design thinking are based in a system or based on a piece of technology. They could quite easily be the fact that you, within the curriculum, buddy up students from one level or another level to help them transition into this program. That you, within the curriculum, design a way that students have to absolutely talk to one another to feel more connected to their learning community because they won't meet these people in person until graduation. So the next stage would be to know how we solve these problems. We do this in Pearson. This is what we do with our clients. We we develop personas, some of it's for our marketing, but then marketing and learning design are often quite closely connected. And so we use these to support the ideas that Sussex generated for their learning design. So we've got some principles, authentic, supported, connected, and challenge. And you've got access to these slides, and so I won't talk you through each of the things because we are running a little short on time. But what I'd like David to do is to say how this, these four principles, were translated in the first programme that we as a partnership have taken online to market. Okay, so we have just launched our first course. It's an MSc in International Marketing Online. We're very excited about it, and we have tried to apply these. And what we're going to try and do here is also show you how you can operationalize these with Canvas. It seems appropriate, given we're at CanvasCon, to, to talk about Canvas too. So when we look at Authentic, how have we done this? Uh, what we've tried to do is using some of the um, superb video functionality within Canvas. Many of you might be using Arc. Um, we have tried to include insights videos within each module, which includes leading industry experts, to try and bring in that externality, that expertise that we think is so important to help individuals make those connections with the professional communities they might join. Within the first course, uh, we've tried to make sure that the assignments are authentic as well. We don't want to give people just tasks that are meaningless. So in the first module, you're actually going to work to develop an international marketing plan to launch a product or service into a country of someone who's on your course, one of your peers, you're going to interview them and you're actually going to find out a bit about the market, where they are in the world, whether that's in Belgium or in the United Arab Emirates, as our students are. Uh, when we think about supported, uh, we're using peer review. So our students are peer reviewing each other's marketing plans to provide feedback and receive feedback from each other so that feedback is not just the sole responsibility of the tutor, but everyone in the, in the course is someone who can contribute to this. Uh, we're also having live feedback sessions. We're using Canvas conferences as a vehicle to bring people together. We're trying to do this at different times in the day to try and accommodate different time zones, uh, recognising again that our students are across the globe. But we're not just using them as a transmission model. We're using them as a discursive feedback session. People are coming together to talk about the feedback they've received, to think about how they can apply that in their future work. They've also got access to some very specialist resources to support them, again, a dedicated student success advisor, someone who's there for all non-academic support, and we've also created a dedicated role of online distance learning librarian who's there to provide information skills advice and digital skills support as well. Thinking about being connected, again, connectivity of our learners. Uh, we're getting our students to post video introductions of themselves. So they're recording themselves straight into the Canvas in interface, into the discussions, and they're introducing themselves to their peers. They're saying a little bit about their aspirations for that particular module. Again, we've paired them together with other people in the course. We're giving them the facilities within Canvas, the group facilities, which gives them the file sharing, the collaborative tools of uh, Office 365, and also conferences, so that they can conduct those peer-based interviews that feeds into the authentic assignments. And then in terms of challenge, we want them to critique and debate topical issues. So in fact, we're actually getting the instructors 
to post weekly podcasts within the modules to bring the very latest information uh, to these students so that the students feel they're talking about current issues, not something that's happened a year ago. Uh, we're providing regular knowledge checks. Jared talks about the power of the, uh, the quiz and assessment tools in Canvas. We're building this in to every single module. We're calling it a knowledge check because we think that's got more meaningful uh, connotations to these students. It's not a test. It's about their formative assessment of their own progress. And we want them to self-regulate. We're giving them the capability to use the ePortfolio capabilities within Canvas to store their notes, to build up to their assignments, uh, and feel like they're making progress throughout each of their modules. So hopefully what we've managed to do in this really quick session is show you how we've taken the concept of design thinking to articulate a vision for what we're trying to do, to try to understand our learners, to distill these into a set of principles, and also showing you how we have operationalized these within Canvas itself to try and create a very rich learning experience. It's too soon for us to see whether we've been successful. Early signs are our students are highly engaged and they're very, very positive. We've still got much work to do. We want to try and push the boundaries. How far can we stretch these, princi these principles? How can we actually merge them together as well? Some of them overlap. Uh, but so far, we think this approach of design thinking has been incredibly beneficial. It's been really quick. I think we're out of time. Uh, so thank you all so much for coming. We didn't expect so many people. If you do have any questions, we'll be around all day. Uh, certainly, uh, we'll be here for the drinks reception at the end. Uh, but here are our contact details if you want to reach out to us. Uh, so thank you very much.